the healthcare metaverse in 2023 and beyond. Hello, everyone, dear audience. Um, before we actually start with our topic, um, I'd like to introduce um, the panelists. My name is um, Thomas, and I am head of a um, company called VM People, and we are specialized in immersive brand building. Um, since the pandemic, um, I got deeply involved um, in the metaverse um, in its most immersive form in virtual reality, in social virtual reality. Um, we are building worlds for our clients, um, also stemming from the um, pharmaceutical industry. And what is maybe special about us, we organize events, not only about the metaverse, um, they are taking place in the metaverse. Um, if you want to try that out, um, it's called Immersive X. And, and it's taking place in November 29th and 30th. So, um, before we actually start, I would try to elaborate on the meaning of the term metaverse. I often experience when you are in a room like that, that you have um, different understandings of what the term actually means. Um, metaverse, at least to my um, interpretation, is a uh, next evolutionary step of the web. The web will become spatial. You can go into it. You can have a social experience compared to what we experience now on the, on the web. It's rather a um, uh, single experience and you can be together with people in one uh, spatial room. And yeah, this is something I'd like to, to state before we actually start. Um, we are still missing one panelist, by the way, but Ian will be here hopefully in a minute. Um, but now I would like to hand it over to you, Philip. Um, what's your background in the healthcare metaverse? And maybe you can introduce yourself a bit. So my, my name is Philip Gerrill. I spent most of my time, 30 years, in the big industries, you know, so let's say 15 years in specialty chemicals, 15 years in the pharma company. I'm now on early retirement from a farmer, but I started to move five, six years ago more into the healthcare. And then I started, you know, the healthcare metaverse discussion because uh, I think my, my key point is about freeing up time from the HGPs. We all have an issue in whatever country you go, we don't have enough doctors, enough nurses and all that, and they are sucked up, sorry to say that, you know, in administration, paperwork and all that. You know, they only spend 30% of their time really with the patient. So for me, the metaverse, like I fully agree with you, is the, is the new version of the internet, more an immersive and interactive uh, environment. I want to move whatever I can from the doctors so that I can again have time to do what they do better with humans, with people. Thanks, Philip. Um, now, um, Lucas. How, what's your story in the healthcare metaverse and can you little, give a little bit background yeah. on what you do? So, uh, my name is Lucas Perez. I'm a medical and strategic expert in the field of healthcare and aging. And I'm also uh, the French representative for uh, the AIT Health, so the European Institute of Technology and Innovations, uh, which is a huge network of entrepreneurs uh, all across Europe in the field of healthcare. And the last but not least, I'm also the author of a book entitled uh, The Healthcare Sport and Wellness Metaverse, where I develop with doctors um, 21 use case about the metaverse regarding the pharmaceutical industry, medicine, sport, and fitness. And indeed, um, the learning part uh, is, is very important into the, into the metaverse. So I, I would say that the metaverse uh, is obviously uh, a virtual reality world, but it's also a connection, a bridge uh, between the real world and the virtual world, you know. And I think that the time and the space um, are very, very close now thanks to the metaverse. Yeah. Philip, uh, you've uh, been here last year. In, uh, I've been, I'm in your shoes now. You're moderating this panel. Um, over the last 12 months, a lot of things happened in regard to the metaverse. Um, what are the 
yeah, what, what would you like to highlight? So you're, you're right, and, and Lucas was here last year when I was moderating, he was already a, a, a panelist. So I think what happened in one year is still amazing. Because last year we were still talking, you know, it's a hype, it's not going to come. Some people, I still think you have to be careful when you hear about the metaverse, not the healthcare metaverse. You know, there were big companies, you know, even Meta and all that. They invested a lot of money into that, but they start to de-invest. And I'm okay with that because I, I'm not talking about these big players, but for healthcare is really for me a platform, a need, more, in, uh, you know, more immersive. And when you can get access, you know, to, to information, doctors, medical information at the other end of the world. So it's really about getting this access that, you know, I'm, I'm living close, you know, in a small village in, in the eastern part of France. If I go to my doctor, if I go to the local hospital, the knowledge is very limited. So the metaverse will open those doors. So what changed a lot, I think, is also now the, to the, the topic about, and it's not the panel discussion, but it's about generative AI. You know, it's also using now AI to generate some of that content that you need on the metaverse. Because if I want to unload doctors, I cannot ask the doctors to provide all the content. Because, you know, then again, it's administration, it's all that. So, of course, I need medical content. I need maybe only a handful of doctors to provide, to provide that. But these things are now happening. You know, so I, I'm, I'm an advisor for a company called AI Medis. They already are launching environments, you know, where basically the point is I don't want to have many healthcare metaverse. You know, so I want, as a patient, I want one entry door. And then what they have, like different buildings, can be different company. So you can have insurance, you can have a pharma company, you can have an education, an, an, an auditorium, things like that. So these things are now coming. They are start to hit the ground. And, I, and you mentioned about having meeting in the metaverse. I'm supposed to have one this week in this metaverse environment because that's now where also the things happen. It's not just PowerPoint, you know. So really, uh, Real metaverse environments are now hitting the ground. Um, if I if I am a doctor somewhere in a rural area, um, can you elaborate a little bit on how specifically the metaverse would help me to make my um, everyday work a little bit more less complex? So so they are two things. Yeah, they are the patient and they are the doctors. So of course, for me, it's still potentially more for the patient to get the access, but also for the doctors. So the whole medical education, you know, go to your GP, you know, because the doctors we have here, these are the savvy doctors, the one going out looking for new technologies, you know, but they are GPs, sorry to say that, they, they are like at the American border, you know, they are in the practice and next, next, next. And the average GP visit in the UK is 10 minutes. In Germany, seven minutes. In Switzerland, in seven minutes. And then I talk, talk about India, where you have 300 patients one day. So what is human in that work the people are doing today? I'm saying today, despite the unnecessary fight that we do between AI and the doctors, the doctors are not human. They are robots today. And only if I can release a piece of that admin work, you know, paperwork, data entry in the computer, they don't look at you anymore, they look at the screen. So if I can remove some of those pieces, moving it to the metaverse and whatever, then the doctor has again more time. But again, the whole medical education piece, when is a doctor getting upskilled today? He has no time, you know? So in the metaverse, he can get upskills 24 hours seven, he decides when he has time to go and he can access worldwide information, not just his local information, going to the next city and, and attending a, an upskilling uh, session. Um, Lucas, um, you uh, run a, a YouTube channel. You've also written a book on the metaverse, so uh, there seem to be a lot of things on your radar. Mm -hmm. What did you um, see on this yeah. radar over the last 12 months? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I would like to say that the metaverse isn't dead yet. So we talk about the metaverse. Uh, the metaverse was a buzzword um, two, two years ago, maybe. And 
I, I would like to say that the metaverse is alive. Um, the metaverse, to take you an example, um, represents $100 billion of virtual good, especially uh, in the sector of uh, gaming and, uh, and wellness. Uh, a lot of uh, skills, a lot of avatars uh, have been sold in, in the metaverse, so it's important to say. And for healthcare, uh, we saw a lot of use case, uh, especially for disabled people, uh, for seniors people. And I think metaverse has a real uh, value, a real added value for uh, this type of people. As proof of that, uh, the medical learning is uh, being gradually developed uh, into the metaverse. Uh, for example, we have recent studies uh, in orthopedic surgery, uh, in dentistry and ophthalmology that prove uh, that the metaverse is very efficient for the doctors, for the doctor's uh, performance. Metaverse enhances uh, the doctor's performance uh, outside of the operating room, uh, for example, with a low risk for the patient, and it's important to say. Uh, the second point I would like to uh, raise today is the fact that in the new metaverse, and, and we, we see that this year, is the fact that a lot of projects uh, using all this concept of identity, of culture, of community, and it's linked to the metaverse, especially for what we call the blockchain-based metaverse. And in this blockchain-based metaverse, uh, identity could be proved uh, through the notion of the decentralized ID. And to give you an example, I would like to mention a Spanish company called DNAverse. DNAverse uses what we have uh, the most precious uh, as a human being. It's our DNA. Thanks to our DNA, we can prove our identity, maybe into the metaverse. Uh, it's, it, it's in progress. And this company uh, wants to uh, trade, if I can say, uh, this uh, genetic information to prove uh, your identity into the metaverse. So it's linked uh, to a healthcare purpose uh, in order to prove your identity as a patient, for example, and it's a use case I develop in this book. And the third example I would like to raise, in, it's an example in Australia. In Australia, uh, you know, um, haptic technologies uh, are, used, are, are used by um, the governments, uh, for example, for disabled people, in order to feel, in order to have another experience. And, for example, uh, there is in Australia a festival called... Um, <laughs> the, Hi, Ian. Hi, Ian. <laughs> the, the Ability Festivals, where people who are suffering of deaf or hard of hearing use haptic technology to replicate some stimuli and feel the world, the real world, but also the virtual world uh, in another way, you know? And it could be a use case. It could be uh, a perspective to merge uh, the metaverse, this virtual reality world, with the virtual world, thanks to this technology, the haptic technology. So metaverse is also about hardware, and it's important to say. Ian, nice to have you. We already started, sorry for that. Yeah, hello. Um, but uh, we'd like to onboard you sure. right now. We um, were just talking about what happened over the last 12 months. And maybe you can give a little background on what you do and what, you, what your observation has been in the last 12 months. What is new in the field of the metaverse? Yeah, so uh, first of all, sorry I'm late. Um, there, there's a lot of exciting things going on in the metaverse. Um, Different countries uh, from the U.S. to South Korea, uh, even China. Uh, but if you look at it, it can divide it into two main things. One is training. So for the physicians, they can do a lot of training virtually uh, using AR and VR. And the second most uh, important part is in mental health. So there's a lot of countries where, in, uh, as you guys know, there's a huge shortage of mental health professionals, you can't get to everyone, but with the use of the metaverse, AR, VR, you can immediately be transported into an area to provide mental health. So those are the exciting things going on. And, and maybe if I want to add that, it's very important because we didn't talk too much, we start now the discussion about the hardware. So my point of view, 
there are some use cases where you need the hardware, the VR. And you mentioned, you know, mental health and all that stuff. But for me, there's still also healthcare metaverse without VR. Because if I want to reach all the people, so that, but from a medical point of view, as you said, mental health and all that. And, and I think the key point is also, it's not about just doing what we do in the physical world, in a virtual world. They are new use cases, they are new opportunities. And mental health for me is also a good example. Because some people don't go to see the doctor because of mental health. Usually the patient is the last one to recognize that he has burnout or depression. The people around him are telling him. But in the metaverse, it may be not an, the same issue to talk to a physician because you are in a virtual world. And then you can also talk what you said about the community. So usually patients are more open to talk to other patients having the same issue than to somebody to say they, they don't understand me. I don't know if you have people here who have had burnout or depression, but usually the people who have not gone to that don't understand. Why you are depressive? You know, you have everything. You have money, you have work and all that. So why? So that's the point where in a community, in the metaverse, there is also a lot of interaction for that. Um, as much for, for the status, now let's do a little time travel. Um, five years from now, how will the metaverse look like? Ian, um, how will the professional life of um, healthcare professionals will change? Will, for example, uh, mixed reality headsets become as popular in, a, in the medical practice as the stethoscope? Uh, so five years into the future, for, for the US, it's still the same. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because a huge, a huge problem is not the technology. Obviously, in California, we have Google, we have Facebook, Meta, all that. But the problem is regulation. The problem is reimbursement. So five years from now, I actually see other countries being far ahead in the metaverse, uh, particularly Germany and China, because they're not restricted by the restrictions we have in the US. Everything is driven more by reimbursement by insurance. That being said, uh, I'd like to add on to your point, which is, I don't know if you guys know, the number one cause of disability throughout the world is depression. And every year, there's 10 million more people that are added to the list of patients who have dementia. And the metaverse, you know, using the technology to keep your cognitive functions up can help decrease that. So there's a huge need for this technology, uh, but I'm more hopeful for other countries to figure this out in five years. Okay. Um, so regulation is a big issue. Um, obstacles we would have to overcome to make the metaverse expand. Um, Lucas, what would you say? How do we come these obstac uh, obstacles? So um, af af um, before that, uh, I would like to say that uh, the regulation is a huge issue uh, for the metaverse uh, regarding the GDPR or the Californian law. Uh, so for the future, if I, I can make some perspective, uh, I would like to say that I hope that the metaverse uh, will be more inclusive and uh, permanent. You know, with AI, and Philip is an expert on AI, uh, AI makes uh, the metaverse very powerful, uh, thanks to chatbot, assistance, uh, 24 hours a day. And uh, inclusivity is, is also part of this metaverse, this open and immersive uh, metaverse, uh, thanks uh, to the natural language processing also. And I hope that this metaverse will be more um, inclusive and permanent, especially for patients. And, so and, we heard and, regulation, inclusivity. Any other obstacles we would have to overcome, Philip? It's not about obstacle, but I want to jump on what you say about NLP, you know, natural language processing. That's another point we should not forget. Language is very important, you know, because when you go to patient, it's often English is not good enough. It's the local language. So all this technology has to bring also on board, you know, the different languages. And I'm lucky to work with a, a gynecologist in, in Dubai who is actually developed, you know, he's a gynecologist, but he's also a, a Cisco certified guy, so he's programming after his surgeries, and he implemented a chat GPT version for women health with already 63 languages. And I think that's the point. If I want to go to the, to the population, to the patient, it has to be local language. Um, 
thank you very much. Uh, now we go travel back <laughs> to uh, 2023. And I would like to open up this panel to um, questions from the audience. Um, there is one. Uh, I hand it over. Thank you very much. My name's Aisha, and amongst other things, I'm a psychiatrist, so very interested in the mental health use cases in the metaverse. So I absolutely am fully on board with the fact that having peer support for those people that are socially isolated can be extremely beneficial. But I also wonder about the double-edged sword that are online communities because we're all aware of the negative impact potentially of social media. So it comes with its good side, it comes with its difficult and problematic sides as well. And how do we ensure that those communities are safe? Because we've seen some quite restrictive legislation passed in the UK around online safety. Thank you. Yes, I think I, I didn't understand all the words, but I know the, basically the, 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 the basic message. And I think the key point is, again, it's the example I gave. It, it was too long to tell, but we need the medical expert to validate this kind of content. And that's actually why I mentioned this example of, about my colleague in Dubai. You know, I need an expert because you take chat GPT. The content is not there. The content that you need as a professional is not there. So I need an expert who can validate that content, you know, even by, you know, association organization. And once AI has this content, then you can use maybe an, because the point is about using a doctor avatar, having the knowledge that you need. And the second point I would like to say is maybe not in your question, but, you know, mental health is also not restricted to, uh, burnout and depression. There are many other things and even pain management and all that and in pain management, for example, VR technology is already used for kids and all that. So there are opportunities, but I think again, for me, of course, validation is an issue from a regulatory point of view, but for me, it's more the validation of the healthcare professional. If you're backing that up, if you're okay with what we say, you will embrace it. Somebody wants to add something? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, indeed, um, AI into the metaverse is a double sword, as you say, and I think that AI is just a tool. Uh, it's a complement. It's complementary uh, to uh, to the um, the physical care, if I can say. And yes, it depends um, the way you use uh, the AI. It's it's very simple. <laughs> and again, just I still am at the point where I'm saying. AI is not artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence for the HCPs. And that's why I, I hate this fight that we are doing, AI is better than the doctor and all that. No, it's a tool for the HCPs. It's not a competition. I guess we got time for one more question from the audience. No more questions? Uh, yes. Hi, Jarek Newski from Australia, also a psychiatrist. It's a psychiatrist corner here. Uh, I think that the biggest concern for me is how to extrapolate the real, real uh, experience into VR and, and back. Just recently, we started talking to occupational therapy departments uh, in one of the university, and uh, I think uh, this is this is a big uh, question for, uh, for utilization of virtual reality: is how to actually find that correlation and how to help uh, our patients to function in both and take the experience from VR into the real world. So thank you, Jaroslav, and nice to meet you in person, for, finally. You know? so, so Jaroslav is indeed, uh, he's having a startup and they are already onboarded in one of the metaverse for Avalon. So there is a patriotic mental health environment where Jaroslav contributed to, uh, to be there. And I think that's really the point, you know, how we do this last step, you know, and again, it's not one replacing the other, it's how you integrate the, 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 the whole things. And again, I think it's not black or white, or it's not one and the, or the other. I think it's a combination. For some, you may better go, you know, to the physical uh, present, and some stuff you can, you can, you can do online. And you're completely right, you know, that I was in Australia two weeks ago, <laughs> And uh, I was talking at the pharmacy congress. And actually, the people were convinced because you also think pharmacy is very physical. You know, it's about, you know, boxes and stuff like that. So what is pharmacy in the metaverse? But when I finished, I got these kind of questions. I had a lady from Croatia coming. Philip, 
how can I get a VR headset in my pharmacy and start to work on pain management and all that. So you're right, you know, that's now, when you ask what is in front of us, this is the next challenge to make it really happen and getting some hands-on so that you can grip it and experience it. Uh, another, I'll just add for a little bit, one of the areas that the metaverse can help with is in the areas of phobias. So I have a, a friend who's a psychiatrist and one of his patients is, is a fighter pilot that all of a sudden, middle of his career, had a fear of flying. Could you imagine? You're, you're showing up on Monday and uh, I'm sorry, I'm scared of flying. You're a fighter pilot. That's kind of part of the deal. So he was able to use virtual reality to again start the simulation, go through the process, go through the checklist, and after he felt comfortable after 10 sessions, he was able to jump up uh, a fighter jet again. So in the areas of phobias, it's, I think it's a very potent tool. Uh, let's use another example, fear of snakes, right? So you can start in the virtual reality, let's say a dead worm, and then next week you can go to a living worm, then a snake that's far away, and then a snake that's closer, and then a snake that's moving. It's really hard to bring a live snake into your office. I think there are some permits for that. But, um, <laughs> but the, the fact that you can use this tool and then hopefully for the fighter pilot, climb back up the, the jet. For those who have severe fear of snakes, hopefully you're not working at the zoo. But if you see something, hopefully you don't jump and have this, these reactions. So, so hopefully those are two uh, areas that I can think about. Thank you. Um, I guess we are already a little bit over time, so thank you. Thanks to the audience for joining the session. Thank to my fellow, thank you for your my pa uh, panelists, my fellow panelists, and thanks for MedTech for having us. Yeah.